So hi again. Um, my name is Francisca and I'm the person that runs the digital copy clutch. Well, it's, the, it's the third time we're doing it online, but the whole format started last year in August. So it's been almost, almost a year. Almost a year. Oh my god. Yeah. I know. Oh god. Next, so we have to do something like super special next next time. Yeah. But so it's been almost a year. It's the third time we're doing it online but actually i think it's worked out quite well because usually everybody is bringing a coffee i have cake just like <laughs> promised <laughs> and yeah my background is um in paleontology i'm also a researcher or i used to be full-time now i like to do this and <laughs> it's been a very good experience because there's been it's been just great like there has never been a coffee clutch that i didn't enjoy and i always invite people that i'm really interested in myself so there's always at least one person that's pumped and <laughs> <laughs> i think um this time i think it's um especially great because now i have vera with me we've been friends since last year mm -hmm. and the wonders of the internet brought us together yeah <laughs> we're both science <laughs> communicators and we started talking online and became friends and yeah that's um when i when i knew i needed to find some cool speakers i decided right away vera had to do it and because of the whole pandemic going on um it has to be postponed because originally we planned for may yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, for me. Yeah. So um, this just worked out better because um, Vera is going to tell you something about her work, of course, in a little bit. She comes from Bonn, so it's not so easy to just pop around and <laughs> be like, hey, here I am, here's my talk. So um, it took some planning, but I think it's a very special time this time for me because mm -hmm. we're friends and also because it's in English. And you can ask questions also in German, right? Exactly, you speak yeah, German. So yeah. if something is unclear, um, feel free to ask questions in like any language that we speak. Which is yeah, like at least like, like three four yeah. languages. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So I think it'll be fine. And um, yeah, don't be shy. I have obviously my own questions, but um, we want to hear from you too. So I think we just we can just start, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I already know you a, uh, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, the other stone. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you end up in science? Like, do you have scientists in your family, or is it just something you woke up one day <laughs> and you're like, "This is what I want to do"? Uh, so I guess, um, like most of my family, they are connected to medical studies in general, mm -hmm. but they're not like pure researchers mm -hmm. or anything. And um, I always knew I'm really excited about science, but I mean, like any other kid, I think like I had three times a day changing my plans for what I wanted <laughs> yeah. to become. So this included everything from like a lawyer to a journalist. A lawyer? Yeah, oh. even a, I, I wanted to be a prosecutor specifically. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> like my yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like to be right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in that, I guess I realized that uh, it's not as um, uh, fancy like in Hollywood movies. No. So I was like, mm, no. <laughs> so you want to be a fancy scientist? <laughs> That's I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, what, what else I'm interested in? And um, I think I was always curious about a lot of things. And Francie knows this about me, but I'm a huge dinosaur fan. So mm -hmm. deep down, I'm like 12 years old. A child uh, whose womb filled with, uh, with dinosaurs. dinosaurs. Yes. It was me too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but I think uh, we briefly discussed it like yesterday. You like to study something which is already dead. Yeah. <laughs> and I actually studied to something that is still alive and um, mm. or in a way alive, and something which has to do with the. Um, yeah, with basically human uh, mm. human physiology. And once I decided one and four all that I'm going to be a scientist, um, I never gave a second thought what I want to do. I always knew that I want to be a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. So because I guess most people, when they think biologists, they think about plant research uh, or zoology. Like animals, yeah. Like directly. Yeah, of course, people are aware about immunology and microbiology and all this kind of stuff. But I guess this kind of like a... Stereotype mm -hmm. is in a lot of people's heads, and when I'm saying I'm biologist, 
Oh, so you like plants? I'm like, actually, no. No, <laughs> do you kill them too? Yeah. And them? Um, <laughs> I can't even care for for like you know house plants normally. Mm. So I'm uh, so no. <laughs> uh, it's better for plant science that I'm not right. in that. So um, and then I decided that like, yeah, I mean for me it was really clear I want to study brain because I think. Like you can call it whatever you want, like character, soul, feeling, but I think what makes us us is our brain. Mm -hmm. Because everything is in there. Everything we feel, everything we're afraid or love, everything we want to know, everything we don't know and don't want to know, mm -hmm. everything is in there. So from whatever things that I can hold my hands like this mm. to the stuff that I can uh, buy a ticket, come to Berlin yeah. with you and talk to you all now. It's all in the brain. Yeah. So I think for me, it, I mean, it still impresses me even though I'm working on this every day for quite a long time already. When kind of my own brain makes brain cells, I mean, it yeah, kind of yeah, still yeah. blows my mind. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, um, how did you start out? So obviously, like you had to start somehow. You, you did a bachelor and a master. And exactly. So where did you do that? And did you start with neurobiology, or did you have to do something first to get there? Like how this process was. So originally from Ukraine. So I did my both my bachelor's and master's back in Kiev, mm -hmm. and um, I did study cell biology and embryology. So mm -hmm. basically, development of biology. Um, so it includes all kinds of things, biochemistry, physics, biophysics, all kinds of things. So until you get to a point where you kind of really specialized, you got to learn a lot, including plants <laughs> and zoology <laughs> and all this kind of things. And um, I think it gives you a great perspective because then you can really see a bigger picture mm -hmm. because when you super concentrate on one thing, you kind of lose a sense of an yeah. entire biodiversity kind mm. of thing, both in real life biodiversity, but also in a in a way of study mm. biodiversity, right? So, mm. and uh, so yeah, I did a lot of really basic courses, and uh, in Ukraine, it's not exactly like um, in Germany. So, for example, masters are not super specialized, so you still learn really broad amount of mm -hmm. courses. Um, so as I said, I'm by the training, I'm cell biologist and biologist of development. So I development of biologist, but, um, development of biology is mainly concerns brain because right. the nervous system is the main focus of development of science mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. Okay. And now you are in Bonn. Did you specifically wanted to do a PhD because you did a PhD so <laughs> are you, did you want to move to Germany and um, because you knew it was good for the field or how did you end up in Bonn specifically? <laughs> yeah uh, good question I'm in Bonn but did um, you speak German before? No or, no okay. yeah so actually my plan was and it's a little bit of like a you know, uh, yesterday we also talked how important it is to fail sometimes, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so I can share my own uh, my own story. I wanted to do first my second master's. So I mm -hmm. wanted to get my second master's degree. And for this, I applied for a scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I got through all the, in Germany, mm -hmm. but first master's, because I wasn't sure whether I would really fit in, whether mm. I would be li like, and I also didn't speak a language at all, mm. uh, which in the end didn't turn out a problem, but, I thought it's useful to know the, to speak at least a bit of the language, the country you will live in for like two years. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, but then uh, I was by the end of my own master program already, and I had really good grades. And um, so basically, they the, uh, I mean the last point was the um, interview, personal interview was like four professors. They come from Germany, right. in person interview you. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, basically they rejected my application mm -hmm. and they said that uh, if I want to pursue a academic career, I should apply for a PhD. If it's, oh. my, if it's my goal, yeah, like, yeah. because they would like, I already almost done with this master. Yeah. So if you want to do Might this, as well. just, exactly. Okay. And first I thought, I mean, first it was like, 
really disappointed because I didn't understand what to, like what does it mean and now I know what the, the overqualified yeah. for something means yeah and I totally get the point I didn't know that about you <laughs> that, yeah so that's how I saved two years of my life yeah. without getting another master degree um, and uh, I actually I learned about the induced pluripotent stem cells mm -hmm. so that's what I'm doing so you can to make long story short you can reprogram skin or blood into any cell type so basically you make cells forget who they were and then you tell them what you want them to become so like i first tell the cells okay now you have to forget that you are blood cells right. and i want you to go back to the stage where you were like embryonic like mm. but we're getting them from from the donors right mm. so we don't need embryos for that and then with another tools, I tell those cells that I want them to become frontal part of our brain, so basically that's this one, mm. which is the most, um, one of the most important parts of the brain. It's not because I'm studying it, it's because <laughs> it's really one of the most important parts. But um, does that feel intimidating to work with real life cells? I mean, we're going to talk about her research yeah. like right after, but that is, I need to know because <laughs> I work on dead things, so it's, you know, it's dead, you can't do anything except break it, and then there's someone there that can help you fix it, right? But was it really intimidating to work with real cells because they're human cells? Mm -hmm. Were you scared? <laughs> but you like, you so I have to tell you that I guess all scientists are a little bit like children, they get super excited about yeah. trying out new things, and as long as you have this excitement, mm -hmm. um. You're not a you know, exactly. Okay. And uh, to be honest, I so my my bachelor and masters I did uh, was animal models. I studied stroke, so mm. I basically I had to model uh, uh, bleeding in the brain, right. right? And it's quite brutal thing, oh. yeah. And I was, I mean, I was always interested in the brain, but and stroke development is it's also very. Um, important yes. right because the consequences of the stroke is uh, sometimes lethal right yeah. um, but nevertheless I thought okay I'm done with animal research to be honest for one thing that it's still quite far from humans right so mm -hmm. you cannot really translate directly what you have done there uh, into humans uh, plus I felt like um, of course, we cannot completely stop with the animal um, animal research. It's just not possible. Um, but I guess if we can minimize it in a way, we should totally do this. And that's why I was so fascinated about this possibility. I mean, how cool it is! You take skin cells, you make them forget. You make and so it's like a, you know, it's like a complete new uh, piece of paper mm -hmm. where you can write down the, the new uh, in biological cell fate so it's oh. really faint you can write down a new new fate for this for this house and you can make yeah. them uh, kind of an improvement from mm -hmm. blood to the brain right so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your research now I think we have the slides too and then um we can maybe also see <laughs> your research a bit more. Let's see. It's coming, I think. There we go. Cool. Yeah. Can we just make it mm. like that? No, no, so I see the entire oh, slide. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. Like that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so basically, I will talk in today uh, to you about so called mini braids, and uh, that's how most journalists call them. But I have to tell you honestly that all scientists hate this term mini brain uh, because <laughs> it's not mini brain, and I will tell you exactly why. Because um, I think uh, a lot of people imagine like a, a, a tiny brain, brain in a jar, and we all sit there and like, precious <laughs> um, but that's not exactly true and I will tell you now whether this is really a, a fiction is it made up thing or is it just exaggeration or maybe we're actually getting close to mm -hmm. having mini brands so um, yeah so on, on the first slide you see it's already stained and sliced mini brands <laughs> no it's fine <laughs> you don't have to go back the first slide. one yeah um, 
Uh, and uh, like this, they look after they've been cut, proceed, stained. I will show you a little bit of each of the steps now. Um, yeah, but this colorful, they don't look when they just mm. grow. Yeah, so they've been stained with the specific uh, techniques and mm. uh, to identify the, the structure. And of mm. course, they, it's, it's a picture, so it's magnified many, many times. So mm. normally they're quite small. So next, please. <laughs> There's Bonnie who also has a brain that does this. Now. I mean, exactly. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there you go. Oh. So on this slide, I just want to show you like the the organoids, how scientists call the mini organs, organoids. Um, they've been around for not that long time, so it's relatively a young method. Um, that's why, uh, but now it's a lot of hype about this. Mm -hmm. So on the left hand side, you can see uh, as a cartoon, I really like it actually, it's all kind of organs you can grow as a mini organs nowadays. So uh -huh. it's an eye, it's a heart, it's a kidney. Um, and it's a brain as yeah, well. Yeah. So of course we'll today concentrate on the brain, but just that you all know, it's mm -hmm. possible to have all of this also in a mini version. Okay. Then. And it's almost everything, right? Yes, exactly. Oh. So, uh, and on the right hand side, I put you a graph and uh, I will quickly explain what it means. So in 2012, um, there was 74 paper in general worldwide, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, which mm, mentioned word organoid in the title. And last year it was 4,511. Wow. So from 2012 to 2019, in seven years, this is all almost unprecedented. Oh. blow up of the, of the there is also always so-called like hot topics in biology but, yeah um so this is definitely one of those it's like the big data exactly of, <laughs> yeah like and uh, also the in the smaller graph right next to it you can see that in 2012 there was just two papers which mm -hmm. mentioned brain organoid in the time oh yeah and now and last year was almost 2000 which uh -huh. mentioned brain so from two to two thousand um, yeah, yeah. And this is just brain organoids, right? So you can also call them, there are different types of brain organoids. So mm. if you go deeper, you get even more uh, different things. But just, I want to just show you that actually uh, from two to 2000, it's quite a big jump mm -hmm. in just seven years. And you also have to keep in mind that every published study takes about two to three years to make. Yes. So you have to keep that in mind, right? Mm. So. Um, it's more common. It's, it's much more common now, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so now let's try to figure out why all the mm -hmm. hype about these organoids, why everyone's so eager to grow them, <laughs> including me. Next, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, it's animation. So can, yeah, oh. so that's how you expect. That's how I, that's how I imagine it. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you expect uh -huh. to see. And uh, I mean, I'm not sure. Luckily or unluckily, that's nothing like it. So can you go next, please? And that's how they look. And next one, then they are a bit older. So here you see one month old organoids uh -huh. and four months old organoids. And uh, so they basically a size of when they get really big, like the biggest they can get due to limitations, mm -hmm. physical limitations. Um, it's about like, I don't know, five, six millimeters. Millimeters? Wow, yeah. Right, right. yeah. So, um, yeah, and maybe you can guess how smaller the oh. organoid <laughs> is compared to the brain. Just a guess, just a... It can. <laughs> no, 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 it's like yeah. one... Oh, man, I'm so bad with numbers. One thousand. Bonnie, can you click this next? A million oh, times. <laughs> A million times. <laughs> okay, so some people have small brains. <laughs> <laughs> so mini brains are indeed super mini brains. Yeah. So they are a million times smaller than our own brain. 
Plus, wow. of course, they do not contain all the brain regions. Right, so right, right. Yeah. They do not feel pain. They mm. cannot think. They mm. cannot talk. We're talking with them. That's mm-hmm. <laughs> they do not respond yet. <laughs> um, yeah, so they are really much, much smaller. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to be really afraid that it's really like a real brain in right, a right. petri dish. It's mm-hmm. nothing like that. Yeah, It's a model. It's a very useful model. And I will show you now why. But it's far away from being real brain. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, it's, I will quickly explain you how you can make all this kind of organoids, right? So uh, they either can come from embryonic stem cells, which is in the lab, mm-hmm. or with the iPS cells, so it's induced pluripotent stem cells, so we have to induce them to become pluripotent. And that's the ones they meant when we said reprogramming. So right. I make them forget that they were skin or blood or mm-hmm. any other cell type, and then I like, make them to report it again, which mm-hmm. means that they could become any cell type of our body. Mm-hmm. And later on, you can use them for generating different, um, different types of organs, uh, organ-like systems. Um, and you see here the terms ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. And this is just a definition of three main germ layers when we develop as a um, as an embryo mm-hmm. and so for example ectoderm it's the most kind of upper one uh, in the embryo and for example retina and brain comes from this one uh, from the endoderm that's the most deepest layer comes intestine liver mm. stomach for example and mesoderm which is in the middle kidney for example comes from mesoderm Right. So that's why you just see the, all the possibilities we can mm-hmm. have, but of course we'll concentrate on the brain today. So you can Ectoderm. go next. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I remember this from biology class yeah. when I, in my master's that we talked a little bit about that. Yeah. Can you go next, please? <clears throat> yeah, so we'll concentrate on the mm-hmm. brain and next, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I will quickly explain you how the organ has been made in general. Mm-hmm. Um, the main point is so-called self-organization so which uh, basically means that we didn't invent like a bicycle we just look what nature does mm-hmm. and try to replicate it. yeah so self-organization in terms of biology because it's a different meaning in chemistry and physics in yeah. terms of biology of a life systems it means that certain elements of the system in this case it's stem cells they can uh, organize themselves mm-hmm. without any additional external cues so they knew what they have to do mm-hmm. they have intrinsic programs which is written in our dna so the stem cells have this very remarkable possibility to if you put them together on a plate in a right environment they will stick to each other it's without simple. exactly okay. without me or anyone else doing something right. to it so they they really self organize mm-hmm. and um the tissue self-organization that's how embryos being formed exactly the same way not just human any kind of Mm -hmm. embryos um it has three main principles so uh can you go next please i will quickly explain you so it's self-assembly so which means that the cells will assemble in a certain way so it's not a random position of the cells so they really know in which way they have to assemble to produce in the end the live organism next please the second one is self patterning which means that they not just assemble in a certain way, but certain group of cells will always stick together uh-huh. and could influence another group of cells. Mm-hmm. And this is um, one, of the, one of the most important parts of forming of our brain because we have so-called gradient during the development of the brain because different parts of the brain, evolutionary have different time of being formed in general, so mm-hmm. they can really influence each other while developing. So this is extremely important that the right part of the brain region is in the right place. Yes. And the last one is self-driving morphogenesis, which means that uh, if you need to form an organ of a specific form, mm-hmm. like an eyeball, for mm-hmm. example, you need that the physics uh, strands inside the tissue works in a very specific way yeah because it's not like our skin that just covers the body mm-hmm. right and becomes the form of whatever it is covering yeah but in case of the of the 
eyebrow and of the retina. So basically that's the cells which helps us to, uh, to see the light mm -hmm. and colors and so on. Uh, it has to be organized in a very specific, physically, in a very yeah. specific way. So at some point, some tissue has to degrade this way, some uh -huh. tissue has to degrade that way, and only in this case, the organ would function properly. Yeah. So that's exactly what it means, mm -hmm. self-driving, because the cells know themselves that once they know that they become an eye, they know that they have to grow in a certain way. Yeah. So that's why it's self-driving. So no mm -hmm. one, in a way, tells them yeah. that they are. And I think I, it, the, the illustrations are, they really help for, even for me to understand the differences. Yeah, because like it sounds very right. complicated when you like self driving mm. morphogenesis and you're like, oh, oh my, my god. god. But, you <laughs> but it's more, actually yeah. really easy. If you mm. have this scheme, easy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if you have this scheme, you can directly see, okay, this is the cells which have, which have to be here and they grew. Yeah, yeah, and this yeah. is the rest cells which have to be there. And, most of the time in some pattern and like the, the green cells would influence the red mm. ones and so on. Next please. So that's basically me <laughs> oh, yeah. standing in front of the incubator. Surprisingly for me, because not that many people uh, who not scientists were in my lab or um, uh, saw me at work, also from my friends, and also including you, you thought it's a fridge. At first I thought and it was a fridge. I, I'm I always heard, hungry. I know? heard <laughs> this like six times from people yeah. who saw that. And I was like, I mean, for me, it's so, I mean, I'm so used to it, right? Yeah. I opened this more from the moon fridge, I think. <laughs> then I was like, I never thought about this as a fridge. Yeah. But so, yeah, it's not a fridge. <laughs> the thing is, Even though in German it's called, called Schrank. So. Schrank, okay. so, okay, fair enough. Yeah. But, um, like, I should have known, obviously. I mean, like, I've also studied biology, yeah, but, but when I see that yeah. immediately, I think, like, oh, yeah, food. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, it's a fridge. Yeah, so basically, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's incubator and stem cells uh, uh, have to stay there at the stable temperature. The temperature is 37 degrees, like our normal body temperature, because it's human cells. Mm. They have to have stable CO2 level because of course they do not have any blood vessels, anything right, in right. there. So the level of CO2 is extremely uh, important to be stable. And of course they have a specific level of humidity mm. in there as well. Uh, and it's dark in there. So you see, right. like in the fridge, like in the fridge. <laughs> It's, it's dark. Just, it's so, a warm fridge. So it's a warm fridge. That's exactly how I describe it to everyone who asks me. It's a warm fridge. Great. So basically what I'm doing to make the organisms, right? I go in cells first as a normal, um, as a, on a normal plate. Then they do not float like organisms. Mm -hmm. So they go attached to the plate. And what I have to do, I have to detach them basically. So I use special reagents when, uh, which will make them again single cells mm -hmm. and they will be just swimming in there. Then I count them so that each organ starts with the same amount of cells. And then, uh, can you go next? And then I put them on this 96 mil plate, which, which I'm holding in my hand, Aww. but it's hard to see because it's completely transparent plate. Yeah, yeah. So basically it, on yeah. day one, so in each well of this 96 volt plate, so it's like that big, it's not really big, uh, it's probably like 10 centimeters mm -hmm. um, long. And uh, uh, in each of this plate of 96 wells, I have one organoid per one well. Right. And in the beginning, like day one, you can see on the scheme, it's completely round. It, it just mm. looks like very small ball of cells, basically. It's completely round. Uh, over time, um, it starts to develop, like you see day 10, it's yeah. become quite fuzzy looking. Fuzzy, exactly. Mm -hmm. Fuzzy, fluffy, yeah. call it the way you want. And basically each of this fuzzy, fluffy part would represent a, a developing part of the hemisphere of a human brain, right. each of this. Uh -huh. um, and uh, over time it's growing and once it's reached the correct time point, can you go next please? Um, yeah, it's about day 10, mm -hmm. would be day 12, would be day 15. Next, please. I have to, it quotes embedding. So mm -hmm. you basically provide the, uh, I guess I also explain it really shortly underneath, uh, that it's, uh, you have to provide the um, external support for the, for the structure which is growing. Because once this organ is really stopped being completely round, 
to develop these regions because it is relatively small, but it doesn't have this matrix anyway because it's growing outside of the mm -hmm. body, right? It needs support to grow the structures bigger because mm -hmm. otherwise they would not develop properly. So basically what this uh, special, like this uh, pinkish solution does, it's like gel-like mm -hmm. and it basically supports the structure. And once they get really old, like, yeah, really old, relatively old, like four months, five months old, they of course grow bigger, so they grow out eventually oh. of that. But in the beginning, they really need that support to, to become bigger. Right. Next, please. Yeah, so this is the video now. Oh, she be, yeah, yeah. Uh, she is yeah. Too, yeah. So before I, so they grow in and I can uh, then to, to analyze them, to create pictures like you saw on the first slide, I have to freeze them. Uh -huh. And freezing them in a very, it calls ethanol best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's 100% ethanol, so right. it's 100% alcohol uh -huh. in there. And what I'm just putting in there, it's dry ice. I s oh, I see. That's what so I that's see. why it's kind of, um, yeah, a bit, uh, looks a bit like a potion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if you go next, you will see how I'm adding a bit more ethanol in it again. Yeah, now I'm freezing it. So this oh. looks actually like this. Uh -huh. So the temperature of this bath is about minus 80. I see. Okay. <laughs> so it's pretty cold. Uh -huh. that. Um, and this is done for the. Um, you can all, all also freeze like that real breast, not just mini breast, which you need to slice. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, the cutting happens, next please, at the minus 20 temperature. So inside, where my hand is inside, yeah. it's minus 20 there. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Refreshing. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's, uh, I mean, uh, around this device, it's, yeah, it's still cold, but uh -huh. it's not exactly minus 20, but the place where I'm touching it at the moment, it is minus 20. Right. So... But you um, have to cut something. Yeah, I'd yeah, be yeah. terrified I cut my hand off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I actually really clumsy, so I'm still impressed that I don't have any stitches done. And uh, to understand how, um, how sharp the blade is, the samples that I made, it's three times thinner than our hair. Three times. Wow. So you can take your one your, of your hair yeah. and imagine that you have a to third. make it a third of it. Yes. Um, and that's why we have to freeze it. So it's not because the tissue in general is very wobbly. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so you have to freeze it and cut at minus temperature so that it's not starting to melt right, right. Uh, or become too um, yeah too jelly kind mm. of like so um, that's how it's done so now you basically can see um, so uh, until you you make them to until you really see what is inside what is the result it takes very long time right. so you have to be quite patient which oh. I'm not so <laughs> it's a daily struggle that's why that's why I worked on dead things yeah you know yeah <laughs> so you can um you can go on please next <clears throat> and now I will show you a little bit of my uh, PhD thesis project which mm -hmm. is done now I'm waiting for my official defense I just, hopefully she's gonna have the soon. title soon I am Gonna be soon a Frau Doctor. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so now you see that on the left hand side you see a physiologically normal human brain. Mm. It's a CT scan. Uh, um, and on the right hand side you see it's a real scan of a patient brain. Uh, you see that it's, co it's smooth. Yeah. Yes. So um, I study what calls lysencephaly, mm -hmm. and if you translate it from the Latin, it means smooth brain. It literally right. means smooth brain. Um, so you can see it's extremely severe thing. Yeah, not it looks not even a neurobiologist. You just look on the difference. It looks wrong, them, and you just like no. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, go next, please. And uh, most of the studies, so this is oh. the human brain, this is the human lysencephalic yeah. brain, so of a patient with the, uh, with the lysencephaly. And the thing is that the mainly, majority of the study was done in mice. Go well, next, mm -hmm. please. But mice are lysencephalic. They have smooth brains. 
and oh. they're doing just fine with that for millions of years. Yeah. So how can you study something which is lethal sometimes yeah. for humans on a model which doing just fine with the with the smooth brain? So of course there was a need. <laughs> so of course there is a need for uh, for better model, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. then the or organoids kind of come into the stage. See. Okay, okay. Because they not just made from human cells, but surprisingly, they actually can really recreate human specific um, timing of uh, appearing of some specific cell types. Mm -hmm. And they also can have like really human specific cell types in the brain, which none other species has mm -hmm. in principle. And in organoids, even though it's such a primitive model, you still see the cells. I see. So go next, please. So I will not go into too much details, but I will quickly show you. So basically on the, on the left hand side, you see organoids from healthy control mm -hmm. cells and on the right hand side from a patient cells. Mm -hmm. And it's the same time point. So you see the size and the magnification of the picture is the same. So mm -hmm. you see that the uh, patient one is like almost twice as small as the control one. Go next. And this is corresponds with the real human brain mm -hmm. situation. So patients do have smaller brains uh, with this disease. And, um, we, uh, and basically this disease is being caused by the, by the mutation of a quite big region of one of the chromosomes mm -hmm. is missing. But there are two main pro uh, two main genes which are involved in the in this disorder. And by on this graph, and so here you see the progression of the growing of the organoids. Uh -huh. So uh, this the biggest one is the control healthy ones. Yeah. The the smaller one is the patient one. And uh -huh. in between with the green, it's when we restore by genome editing, we kind of copy paste back. Oh, each, each of these two genes yeah, yeah, yeah. to see whether they have and uh, surprisingly they actually have quite a like um, um, effect so mm. even if you have just one restored it's already much much closer yeah. to control than to patient situation uh -huh. so and uh, of course uh, I mean we found out also the part of the mechanism of this disorder which was not known before and with the um, mice, you would not be able to do that simply mm. because the, uh, what we saw, the effects of this uh, mutation is not the same way uh, in mice. So, mm -hmm. because of course, mice are extremely helpful models to gain very profound knowledge about each function of these proteins mm. or genes involved, but um, without confirmation on human cells, um, it's not a complete picture mm -hmm. of us because mm -hmm. as you like between us and rodents in like evolutionary perspective it's about 70 million years mm -hmm. between us so it's a, it's a long time yeah. <laughs> it's a long time to go so um, of course we cannot directly translate everything we have found in mice uh, to humans, yeah. but that's why it's great that such a huge amount of work has been done already mm -hmm. and now we have kind of just <laughs> just Confirmed whether this really holds true mm -hmm. for, for human cells, right? Mm -hmm. Go next Yeah, and this is some colorful pictures of inside <laughs> organ organoids. So now you can see that so each of this how you call it fuzzy regions yeah. what we saw on the, on the real so basically Everything which you see here, uh, each of them is represent one loop structure like mm. that. And this represents a hemisphere of developing human mm -hmm. brain. So, and you can see that the, the, the size of what we have here and what we really have when the brain develops, of mm. course, it's just incomparable. But as I said, even though it's such a um, simplistic model compared to our own brain, uh, but it gives you an amazing insights into how you can use this. Yeah. Do the colors mean something? Uh, yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, when you stain them, um, so basically uh, you just choose. You can choose the color. Mm -hmm. You will become later on. The main point is that first you 
um, it's it calls immunocytochemistry. Mm -hmm. So you so it works in a way like our immune system does. So you you have a protein coupled with a specific part of the receptor, uh -huh. and then if you put it on the cells after you cut uh, you cut them, if you put it on the cells. Um, and it finds the proteins that is expressed. So mm -hmm. it, it is. It has the protein you are looking for. Mm -hmm. Protein or transcription factors. You can stand a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. If it finds it, it couples it, mm -hmm. um, and then you put on top of it a so-called secondary antibody. So the secondary antibody can couple with the with the first part, and then right. you can visualize it. So because without oh. the second antibody even if the first one coupled and you have a protein but if you don't have the one which has this fluor from which would by the work with the microscope excite the certain wavelength mm -hmm. so that's why you can have green you can have red you I can have blue can. and um, you can also have a so-called far red so that's which we cannot see by eye mm -hmm. but, cam but camera can mm -hmm. right so and uh, the the color of the secondary antibody you can really decide yourself it's uh, okay um you can combine them in a different way mm -hmm. so uh you can do double stain and triple stain and uh because sometimes you need to find out whether some of the proteins you're looking for transcriptional factors they are colocalized mm -hmm. so you need the cell for example be double positive for certain things and then you can say okay that's really the cell i was looking for right okay so next, please. And here we will once again no. <laughs> on a comparison between our organoids and the brain. So human brain, rodent brain, and the organoids. Uh -huh. And uh, here you can see on, with the scheme on the um, left-hand side, you see all the different types of human cortex of our brain mm -hmm. matter. Um, uh, which is present normally in human brain. I Developed see it says like brain. neurons. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. Next to it, you see mouse brain. Mm -hmm. And right next to it, you see human organoid. Yeah. So um, human organoid, you can see like, even from just looking at this, looks a bit more like mouse brain. <laughs> Yeah, much more than actual the, the actual human brain, right? Oh. So it's a bit more simplistic. Mm -hmm. um, another important part is that it's of course lacking a lot of cell types, which, so our main problem now, because we know how to make different types of brain organoids, mm -hmm. but our problem is that we cannot make, um, we cannot make all cell type at once. So this we still don't know how to do. Remember I told you quickly about this uh, three different germ layers? Yes. So for example, uh, to make uh, microglia cells, which is very important for our immune response in the brain. So it's like immune cells mm -hmm. in the brain. They come in from a completely different region of the embryo. So if you okay. block uh, so to end up in frontal cortex, for example, so yeah. this part of our brain, uh, you have to actually block two signaling pathways, which would normally make microbes. Mm. So we still don't know how to make it all in one dish. Kind of. see, okay. So we can do it separately, <laughs> but not together. But not together. Mm. So if you go next, you will see what else is missing. So first of all, uh, organ is about four, five, six millimeters and two three million cells and the human brain has 85 billion neurons right and about the same amount even more it's still arguable still mm. we kind of agree on that but same amount or even more glial cells okay so actually in the in, in our brain much more additional cell types than the neurons itself mm -hmm. actually so um yeah and next please and that's the list of cells which missing. So in the TDL cells, it's blood vessel cells. Uh -huh. uh, microglia, I just mentioned, it's uh, our immune cells in the brain. And interneurons, it's also neurons, but why it's lacking. Um, so in the cortex, um, we, need both um, we need both inhibition and excitation. Mm. So our neuronal networks only work when something can excite another neurons mm -hmm. but something else can inhibit the other neurons so this is very tight control mm -hmm. between inhibition and excitation uh -huh. uh, because otherwise if you have 
too much excitation in terms of neuronal networks, you can end up with having epilepsy. Oh, because okay. it's like it's like you can imagine this a bit like a like a, your normal um, electricity mm. uh, network. In if you put on too many things, right, it's kind of and and your network, for example, too old because you live in an older building, yeah. and it kind of just work with the dishwasher, with the washing machine, with the, the microwave, hair dryer, yeah. hair dryer two mic, uh, I don't know, two yeah, yeah. two laptops at once. Right. What happens? It it just everything stops at once because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. too much. It's can't handle it. Right. Okay. So our brand works pretty much the same way. No one ever explained it so well to me. <laughs> so our brand works pretty much the same way. If we if we put too much pressure on it, yeah, yeah. you're like no, okay, shut down. <laughs> This so we need uh, really the inhibition and excitation mm. really controlled. Yeah. So most of the psychiatric disorders have this balance in excitation and inhibition. Yeah. So that's why technically two different brain regions cannot talk to each other, for mm. example, properly talk. I mean, uh, spread the elect yeah, yeah. electricity. <laughs> um, uh, or they like, or one talking too much and the other one does not mm. respond. So you can imagine it kind of I like see. this situation, yeah? Okay. And interneurons, they are responsible for inhibition. Mm. But this is very interesting part of cell, type of cells because uh, quite recently, actually, maybe like maybe 10 years ago, so for science, I mean, in a huge perspective, it's quite recently, um, we find out for sure that they are not being born in cortex. So they've been born in a part of the brain which calls ganglionic eminence, mm -hmm. and they are somewhere here in development brain. Mm -hmm. So they have to migrate all the way up yeah. in the right way, in the time, in the right time, right place, mm -hmm. right speed. Otherwise, we would be pretty much screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> but um, for making them, you need to uh, you need to activate another type of signals. Mm. So we still cannot make the one which yeah. excites and inhibits at the same time. This is just not. I mean, like, it sounds, don't know. It sounds amazing that our body can do that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it, much could go wrong. Plus blood vessels. Plus, oh you know. So it's and we still did not figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we joke in that like our brain like hides this own secret from you yeah. know from us how to make it you try yeah. to find it out it's like no no not today <laughs> try again and um uh, yeah so basically uh, so that's why some labs uh, went other way and mm. they uh, because they know how to make them separate that's me but Another impressive thing about the organoids so if you put the right type of organoids which normally should communicate somehow in our body um, in like physically very close in a physical proximity mm -hmm. they would fuse uh -huh. and this interneurons would migrate yeah. to a cortical part of another organ because they really secrete all the right signals mm -hmm. and it's I mean it's pretty impressive yes. that you can really do that you yeah. know and recently it has been also published, like last year, um, that if you put a relatively old organoid, about a year old organoid, in a dish, uh, next to it you can put a spinal cord from mice, real spinal cord. And next to it, you put a muscle. Mm -hmm. And normally, how this is supposed to work, or how it works in our body, so we have cortex, we have region in the cortex which would be responsible for another region in the brain to tell muscle to contract, basically. Mm -hmm. So then, this another region in the brain uh, connects to so-called upper motor neurons. So upper because they quite up. And then those upper motor neurons connect to lower motor neurons, and directly the neuron which would uh, contract the muscle. So basically, you like kind of press a button and your leg contracts, right. or your or what I'm doing now without yeah. even thinking about this. Yeah. So the biggest proof of principle would be that those cells actually function. That if this whole cascade would be replicated, and it does. So if you put human cells uh -huh. which are supposed to regulate upper motor neurons, they connect like you don't do anything. They, yeah. You put them together in the right, in the right place, yeah. in the right medium, surrounded this, uh -huh. 
uh, they connect so the they really intrinsically know <laughs> who they are and to yeah. whom they have to connect and it and the muscle is really contracting so basically this mini brain make a real muscle yeah through real spinal cord to contract and uh, in a dish in a dish yes what? <laughs> yes wow yeah and uh, basically to prove that this is real those researchers they model um in a way spinal cord injury so they cut the connection between the brain and upper part of the of the spinal uh -huh. cord and the contraction stopped so right. it was really specific it was not like just randomly because right. they released some signals you mm -hmm. know it was indeed specific wow go on <laughs> And this you have here the scheme of all kinds of things you can do with organoids. Mm -hmm. So first evolution. So you can grow uh, you can grow organoids from different species, from primate, from human primate, mm -hmm. non-human primates, and compare them. And surprisingly, they really like so chimpanzee organoids behave like chimpanzee brain. Mm -hmm. Human organoids behave like human brain mm -hmm. during brain development. So you can really you can basically follow up evolution in the real time yeah, yeah. by making this. Uh, then you can use them for developing um, yeah, different uh, treatments or uh, starting a disease, right? Mm -hmm. So you can uh, now uh, become more and more popular to make these organoids, get them mature enough, and then transplant the cells derived from them to a real a brain of mm -hmm. mice for example uh because if you want to study like degenerative disorders which normally like alzheimer or parkinson which normally onsets very late um in life uh you need like an in a way all brain around those cells right 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 um so you cannot do this in any other way mm. with human cells so this become more and more popular this approach mm. to transplant the cells mm. um, into mice you can of course also study all kind of genetic disorders like i did during my phd uh -huh. so you can either take patient cells and reprogram them and make organoid and see what's going on or you can introduce the mutations so you can take healthy cells right and you can just cut out the gene which is responsible for certain mm -hmm. disease and see how they behave and then compare it to the patient data mm. and even more impressively somehow for me because you can also study the environmental effect on the brain with organs mm. so genetically totally healthy normal cells and then uh, when the Zika virus outbreak oh, yeah. happens, they infect organoids with Zika and they saw exactly the same result. With the small brains. Smaller brains, right. smaller organoids. Mm -hmm. And thanks to actually organoid, they prove what exactly happened. So basically what happened is that the Zika, so the receptor to the Zika virus, so the way the virus can get inside the cell, is present mainly on the cells which actively divide during brain mm -hmm. development. And which in the end would be the, the reason why we have such expanded and folded brain. Right. So the virus can infect the cells and it's really toxic for the cells. The cells are just simply dying out. Mm. So it's not enough cell to make such a big brain right, anymore. Right, right, right. But without uh, organoids, you can't prove it. Yeah. So that's, that's or, interesting. for example, now people also start to use an organoids to study like um, prenatal exposure to alcohol or drugs, oh, for example, yeah. because, uh, um, yeah, you would also see the effect and they do really see the effect quite mm -hmm. comparable to what in the end patients do have, mm -hmm. but they of course cannot say the mechanism unless they really follow it up right. and with organoids it's possible. And now they also start being used for drug discovery because they have this human specific cells, which not, no one else has. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that the system is still quite new and every organoid looks quite different inside. Mm -hmm. So you cannot find two exact same organoids. Right. Okay. And okay. of course, for the drug screen, you need a system which is extremely comparable. Yes. So of course, for like experimental studies, it's possible, but for like official preclinical studies, it's not that widely used just mm. yet. But I'm pretty sure um, we we get in there quite okay. soon. Yeah. Go next, please. That's basically just to sum up. So the organoids can be generated from both embryonic stem cells and reprogrammed stem mm -hmm. cells. 
they are self-organized, so which means that they really stick together without us telling them what to do. They know what to do. And, uh, but you have to keep in mind that they cannot think and feel mm -hmm. and uh, because they form on the very distinctive part of the brain. And to be who we are, we need the entire brain. So, um, you know, when people um, used to say, oh, we're using our brain only for three percent. It's not like you're mm -hmm. using your brain all the time, 100 percent. The question is, how are you using it? That's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's another story. <laughs> but your brain has to work 100 percent. Otherwise, you, it's not possible. Where did that come from? Who started saying that? I don't people know. that know nothing. <laughs> And uh, and it's always nice to believe that also I have such a potential. I potential. Sit, yeah. I sit on my on my couch and and watch Netflix all day. But I have such a potential. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, once if I, I, I want to, I can stick into the potential. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I do tell myself. That. So this is not true. We mm. use our brain hundred percent. Right, right. So um, and uh, of course for such a complicated thing like consciousness. I mean, mm. it's again like human specific one can argue thing yes so so for really highly cognitive functions like feeling emotions character character yeah. and we need the entire brain mm -hmm. we cannot have just half of it i mean if we would evolution would not go into all these troubles to yeah. make such a big thing and That's it's true. very complicated and time consuming and energy consuming right. like our brain, for example, even on a normal situation when you don't even watch Netflix, you just lay down. So you basically just exist. Um, your brain needs about 20% of the entire energy you mm. consume. So if I eat all this cake, I can just say like I'm fueling my brain. <laughs> yeah, you can. I've done <laughs> this myself. And actually, my the brain needs it. <laughs> and actually the media for in which the organoids are growing, it's uh, full of glucose. Nice. So they need sugar. <laughs> it's official. <laughs> <laughs> take it, take it to the bank. It's so if I, if, I have, if I have a craving for sugar, it's just my brain telling me. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When, <laughs> you when, when, when I reach your full, full potential. Uh, you, hear, you heard it. <laughs> if you eat that candy bar, yeah. your brain needs it. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, another important thing is that it's still limited in uh, blood vessels. So there is no blood vessels, no vascularization. Mm -hmm. But even if you overcome, you need heart to pump this blood. So mm -hmm. the fact that you will have blood blood vessels doesn't mean that they will be functioning. So right. keep that in mind as well. And uh, of course, as I already mentioned, they represent only the defined brain region. So mm -hmm. not entire brain. It's far from being entire brain. And uh, it's it's really cool model. It's really useful, but it's far from being real brain. They right. don't suffer. They, they don't feel pain. Mm. Um, they cannot do any kind of really high cognitive functions and so on. So at least so far, this is for sure. Mm -hmm. this for sure. That's pretty much it. So go to my last slide. <laughs> I really love this picture. Unfortunately, I've it's not my picture. picture. Yeah, I just seen that. Um, you posted that. Yeah, on, on yeah. It's, a, it's a cover of uh, one of the very recent uh, cell paper journal. And it's a real picture, so yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. edited. But so, uh, yeah, smile at your brain. <laughs> smile back at you. And unfortunately, it's not my picture, but Next picture time. from the lab, from another lab, but it's, uh, I really loved it. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, it looks really like a smiley, smiley face. It is smiling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty much it. So if you have any questions. Um, yeah. How to eat more sugar, I don't feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> person to ask. <laughs> I have. I have some of my own questions, of yeah. course, because um, even though we've know e we know each other, it's still like the time for me to ask you all the, all yeah. the questions, right? So, um, so we have the chat open, so if you have questions, just like, we'll, we'll see it. And if you're too um, shy to uh, read them out yourself, I will, I will do that for you. But um, there's one, there's, okay, there's mm -hmm. one question. Yeah. I think we briefly um, talked about this earlier. How ha okay, so <laughs> how has working on, let's say brains, how has that changed your way of thinking about your own brain? Like, because you use your brain to work on brains. Mm -hmm. Like, do you sometimes stand on lab and you're like, oh my God, what, I'm, 
what? But <laughs> isn't it like to, to be strange? Honest, to be honest, um, I think that in this way, most scientists would tell it's just cool. You know, it's, it's cool, for yeah. us it's not <laughs> creepy. It's it's. I mean, in a way, it it still really fascinated me every time because I kind of I know what to expect because I worked with them for quite a long time already and. I know what you expect when they are day 20, when they are mm. day whatever, 100 old, when they are one year old. I have organisms which are a bit older than a year mm. in, in the incubator now, back in born. And of course, like, sometimes it's really, like, weird feeling in a way, because you're, as you said, your own brain produces mini brains. Looks at brains, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks at brains, and sometimes I really think, like, what? Like my brain, I mean, I am my brain, but yeah, yeah, what yeah. my brain think about looking at the another brain? brain? <laughs> like, do they, like, you know, I mean, it's, um, of course, I know that it sounds kind of silly. And I mean, most of the time you don't really think about this because you have so much like routine work. You, right, yeah. You don't really take it as a, oh, I'm going brains, you know? Mm. So, uh, so that's not like you come into the lab and like, today I'm going to do some brains. Right, you know? yeah. So you, uh, you, you don't do that. But um, yeah, I think it's, I, it's not creepy. It's, it's really exciting and mm. I think, as I already also mentioned to you, I think a lot of uh, scientists, they're just like uh, small children and they're yeah. excited about whatever thing they're doing. It's like a shiny new toy for you, mm. um, uh, but filled with anxiety, yeah, and yeah. Around problem and all kind of things. <laughs> but it's still like a shiny new toy and yeah. when something is working, you're like, wow. Yeah. How cool is that? That's I true. make it look like a part of developing human yeah. brain. So, of course, you get one here and there, such moments when you think, wow. Uh, like one of those moments was um, when we, because the disease I was studying is quite rare disorder. So, uh, it's not that many, um, it's not that many patient, real patient mm. data, not models, but the patient data. And um, in one uh, clinical report, there was a picture of a yeah, sliced human brain of a fetus who, mm -hmm. who were never born because mm -hmm. of the severity of this disorder and partially it looked like indistinguishable from what I just made with oh, my I hands yeah. oh, wow. this was really like this was one of the more like, wow right yeah. right but yeah. uh, of course in between this wow moments it's a lot of um, routine work mm. and uh, most of the time you don't really think um, about so it, yeah right. sure I work with human cells but I never you know I never connect them to a, right to a patient or yeah. to a donor because it's also then it would be hard to think that I mean I have cells from like walking around people you yeah know? so for example in France it's prohibited to work with your own reprogrammed cell or you can't just be like and yeah. Look at it. <laughs> yeah, so it's for example prohibited. Let's see. For I mean it has ethical reasons. Of course. Because I mean imagine you make mini brands out of your own cells and then you see yeah. something you don't want to see that. Of course, yeah, yeah, I didn't even think about it. Yes. Because see. then you also sequence the genome of the cells and then you basically right. know technically what is wrong with you, not in general. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> but very precise. But I could make you do it. As yes. Colleague. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but you still prohibit to work right. with your own cells, and then there is have a practical reason because um, it's your own cells. Mm. So the probability is mainly zero, but it's there so that it can get somehow into your body back, right? And your body will not recognize it as an invasion of other I cells see. because it's your cells. Yeah. And it can end up and grow in like a cancer. Mm. So, uh, I mean, it never happened, but the probability, technically, technically right. if you get completely crazy, you cut yourself and you pour a bit of your yeah. cells back into the wound, I mean, it won't happen. Mm. But theoretically, it's right. possible, and then your body would not recognize it as a threat. So, right. yeah. Okay. We do have a question. Um, oh, we have. Several. Let's uh, read the first one from mm -hmm. Maria. She said, um, will your research help develop drugs for schizophrenia? I think that's just like an example, right? As far as I know, animals do not get sick with 
schizophrenia? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, most of the people here agree that the psychiatric disorders and animal models is not really uh, precise mm -hmm. because, for example, schizophrenia, apart from um, some instability, patients have hallucinations of different types. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you cannot ask mice whether they see yeah, two yeah, mice yeah. instead of one. Uh, or whether they smell something mm. weird. So, I mean, you can ask, but hopefully they will not <laughs> reply to you. So pinky of the brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so, also, lots of mental illnesses develop much later in life, right? So actually, it's not even that the problem. The problem is that I think most people now agree that in general, all the psychiatric disorders, regardless whether it's schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, whatever, it's more like a spectrum of the same mm. pain, but with the different reasons. Plus, I think that the problem is that the more complicated system gets in general, right? We know it in life. The more bugs it can have, the same with our brain. Mm -hmm. Because our brain is the most complicated in animal, uh, in animal kingdom. World, yeah. kingdom. Uh, and that's why we end up with the problems that it's too complicated sometimes, right? right? So this is at least the, the hypothesis most people agree on that is simply that mice or, or rats or whoever, they can have some signs, like if you have physically change, mm -hmm. changes during psychiatric disorders, mm -hmm. uh, but most probably not on the level of really, because for this you need higher cognitive function. Mm -hmm. to, to something got broken, you need to have this something. Right. And if they don't have it, it can't sick, break. It can't break. <laughs> right, right, right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll like, there's another question from Catherine, but maybe we'll like, because this kind of goes together. Maria has another question. She said, are there any ethical aspects when working with human organized? That's something, okay, actually, I, I also wrote down yeah. as a question. So, yeah, so I can answer then uh, to mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, since it's still human tissue mm. and uh, we of course aim always to make it better and to make it more alike to human brain, mm. right? Um, of course, there are always like at any conference you go, where there is organoids, brain organoids involved, there is always an ethical panel discussion in it. Mm -hmm. So it's very strictly regulated. So and um, every strictly like every study which gets published still being discussed ethically if it's kind of like a big landmark study and uh, yeah recently um like last year um in university of san diego they published a paper where they claim that they record a uh, brain waves pattern alike to neonatal stage so organoids can produce brain waves like things compared to newborn or preterm born child and of course like then even new york times wrote about yeah. this and they were claiming like so can they feel now mm. like can they like if they produce in the same waves like yeah. i mean waves means that it's active and right, it yeah. does something mm. right so they measured the eeg recordings mm. basically um but I mean, even the group themselves, it's, it's a great uh, researchers. Mm. They also explain that first of all, it's alike. That doesn't mean that it's exactly so, the same. Right. <laughs> see, there uh, we go. <laughs> second of all, uh, again, those organoids do not have different brain regions. Oh. So whatever they produce, so basically it's like you would talk to someone who will not answer to you. Mm. Like, would that be a dialogue? No. No. You will be talking and will, you will never get the response. So, right, right. so then we have to redefine this. Like, what does it mean that if they just spontaneously um, doing something, firing some which cause action potential in, uh, in neuroscience, basically they can produce the impulse. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that this impulse lands somewhere, first right. of all. Second of all, even if it this lands, normally you have a response from the cell. Right. Does it have a response? Mm. Uh, most probably not because yeah. it hasn't been showed mm -hmm. um, so that's yeah so they still cannot feel cannot feel pain cannot think mm. um, because for all of this you need entire brain as I said mm. yeah but 
yeah, um, ethically wise, it's always been monitored really, really closely. Mm -hmm. And the biggest uh, stem cell society, which calls International Society for Stem Cell Research, ICCI, uh, because they normally issue the guidelines for working with stem cells and they revise it like every couple of years. Mm -hmm. And now in the preparation and new guidelines for, for ethical concerns working with organoids, so they collect, because as I showed you, like, from two papers in 2012 to 2000 papers last year. So like entire world now working on that. So of course they have to regulate mm -hmm. it in a way. Um, of course, every country has its own regulations that somehow complicates the, the entire thing. Yeah, but in most countries it's controlled pretty tightly. So um, uh, ethical concerns is on the agenda. So people really talk about this. What does this mean? especially after study what I just described where you can connect to spinal cord and then to muscle right, yeah, yeah. which means they do behave like uh, like uh, so what looks like a duck and walks like a duck, duck. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. in this case it's a bit like that so yeah, if yeah. it looks like brain, because before there was like okay it looks like brain cells but does it express all these mm. markers okay it looks it does express oh okay <laughs> does it function like a brain cells looks like it yeah does it function together with the other brain cell because one brain cell makes nothing mm. right so it really needs all the time talking to someone because otherwise it's, it cannot do anything yeah. um and now the question is like does this con it's is it really a conversation mm. if it's a conversation then uh we have to rethink <laughs> but uh, still even if the cells would really form a functional networks not just spontaneously firing potentials um it's still of course far away from the way our brain works mm -hmm. and um it's simply uh it's too many in, like the great example was i recently attended one of the talk where we were describing like for example there are retina organoids so eye organoids mm -hmm. and they could respond to uh, light stimulus. Right. So does that mean that it's an eye? Like, no. It has <laughs> cells yeah. which can respond to a light. Yeah, cool. yeah. But does it, is it an eye? No, it's no. not an eye. Yeah. Because we can have eyes, uh, but if there is something wrong with the connection between eyes and a special part of the brain, um, which regulates your vision and analyzes your vision. It's like you have camera which does not connect to your computer. I mean, who you have camera and if you will connect it, it will work. Yeah. But if you don't have this connection, you can have thousands of this camera with no... Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. There would be no outcome. Right. So this kind of like, in a way, a great example of like, yeah, it has brain cells. They look like brain cells. They even might respond to certain things like brain cells but it doesn't mean it's a brain mm. yeah you explain like with exa the examples <laughs> you choose are very good yeah. um catherine wants to know what your biggest failure was <laughs> doing your phd and how did you deal with it i think um asking any phd student <laughs> there will be failures so yeah so <laughs> i think uh um i think my um i cannot to be honest, it was too many, so I, <laughs> I cannot pick like the, the biggest one, but I think um, the biggest, more like personal perspective one was that I thought um, something works out much more often inside than it really does. Right. So, you know, you have to accept that. So I don't know, Catherine, if you are a PhD student or not, but um, if you are, then you know that like on the best day, in the best case scenario, about like 10% of whatever you're doing is actually worth something. Right. The rest has to be remade, uh, mm. thrown away, forgotten, have to figure out why it doesn't work. And if it's work, you still need to figure out why it's work. So yeah. um, I think like overall you work, uh, it's never like nine to five job. You work on the weekends, you work, um, yeah, all the time, but you have to learn how to fail. This is, I guess, learn how to fail is the most valuable lesson I, I've got out of mm. my PhD. So you learn how to fail, 
uh, you you don't take it so and another thing you have to separate yourself as a person with your success in science mm. because you're a scientist of course but first of all you're a person and if these two things merge too much and if you f your project is failing I, it could happen it could, mm. because you are there to create something which was never there before you came into the picture so of course the probability is it won't work it's really high because you work with high-risk projects most of the time mm -hmm. and of course if you um if you don't learn how to fail in a way you just think okay it's an experience i learned my lesson from it if mm -hmm. if there is something you can change about this it's not always the case and then move on you know so yeah. do not so I guess the you didn't the, fail as a person exactly. Yeah. So I guess the main fail was that I was too naive and uh, unicorns, rainbows, and all this kind of things. Everything's working uh, immediately. Science, science is yeah. so cool and rock. No, uh, science yeah. it is cool, but first of all, it's extremely hard job. So mm -hmm. be behind the fact that I show you like those couple of pictures of organoids, it's months and years of work and. Uh, and if you cut yourself with the cryotome blood, literally. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, once I actually did cut myself, but only once, which is still a big surprise that it happened only once, and I yeah. still have all of my 10 fingers because this is. Who knows me in person knows that I, I mean, last week I cut myself so badly with a piece of paper, <laughs> uh, taking it out of the printer. Real story, but it was blim like half a day, seriously, because it was it like so like, yeah. bad. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and then someone trusts me with a very sharp knife um, to cut a mini yeah. brain. Yeah. I'm doing this for a living, man. Yeah. And so, yeah, questionable. But, but, I'm, <laughs> but I'm glad that you're calling it a job because I read somewhere the other day that one of the main things you can do for your mental health if you're in academia, if you're a PhD mm. student, is know that this is a job. It's a job yeah. and it's not just you it doesn't just it's not the only thing that defines you as a person and like you said when you fail mm -hmm. it's not you a failure as a person it's just part of your job just to exactly. work out like yeah. it's still yeah. at the end of the day it's a job and it's important to know that everyone fails like seriously yes. like it's i guess one of the more and i i was never i was not always that wise and, and you know <laughs> yeah it's just a job no i mean i learned it very hard way and if i can protect someone from you know yeah. like getting into the same trap i'm just telling you everyone is failing it's fine and not everybody just, says it though and and you have to just think for yourself can i live with the fact that my 95 percent of whatever i'm doing from 8 a.m to 10 p.m sometimes on the weekend will be thrown away mm. are you fine with that that out of this like 12 hours fake five percent would be work and mm -hmm. it's not like not one year not even two years it's, it's like four four, yeah. four at least right in in the practical biology science so but see that's why i did paleontology <laughs> <laughs> it the thing doesn't die you don't have to put it in a fridge <laughs> and <laughs> what, what just came up to my mind actually about the failings that everyone fails and uh Last year, uh, when the conference was a real thing, um, yeah. I went to this ICCR conference, so the Stem Cell Society is the biggest stem cell community mm. in the world, and they hold the conference once a year. Last year, it was in LA, in the US. Uh, this year was mm. uh, virtual, um, supposed to be in uh, Seattle, but it never happened. Right. So, uh, and uh, one of the head of the society is um, Yam uh, Yamanaka, who got Nobel Prize in 2012 for discovering the script programming mm -hmm. practice. So, to, he's an impressive scientist. He is, I guess, one of the youngest uh, uh, Nobel Prize laureates in uh, medicine and uh, physiology. And um, he was, I mean, he's a noble laureate. Mm. Everyone knows his name who works with stem cells. There is not even one single person in this field who doesn't know who Yamanaka is mm. and what he did. And he came up to a stage. He also was genuinely funny, which is not that often happens with serious no. scientists. <laughs> he was genuinely funny. And then he was like, okay, 
I will show you today some unpublished results. And everyone got oh, so excited, right? All failures. Unpublished, <laughs> resu uh, unpublished results uh, from, a, you know, one of the coolest scientists in yeah. this field. And then he was like, yeah, it's unpublished because it got rejected. Mm -hmm. And everyone was like, Yamanaka paper could be rejected. <laughs> like, you know, like you would never have yeah. thought this. Because you think, I mean, if I would be a reviewer and I see his name on the list, mm. I would be like, give me that. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I have no questions. Great job, you know? Um, but um, so, which means that even if you're a novel person, mm. right, you run two institutes, you are the more, one of the most famous person in this world, your paper still can be rejected. Yeah. And it was so relieving like oh my god <laughs> if you should get society or oh, sorry if um if shinya yamanaka paper is uh, is rejected then i mean i, I can just like, you. relax i mean yeah. now i'm like oh, yeah, like yeah. a novel project <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, it's i guess uh, science uh, a failing is a part of the process mm. so you just have to um, I mean, I wouldn't say enjoy it, it's never enjoyable, but uh, so I wouldn't lie that I've got a revelation how to enjoy my failing. No, I still, mm -hmm. of course, get upset and frustrated and sad and whatever, but yeah. you just have to, for yourself, see whether you are fine with this amount of failing. Mm. Because it doesn't mean that you're just bad, it just means that the project might be not, uh, have to be really fine or whatever, right? So. You just have to decide for yourself, yeah. Maybe this go, this goes, uh, my next question probably goes good then with the one we just talked about. Um, what is the best thing about your work and what is the worst? Um, Maybe start with what's the worst? The worst is that my cells need me every day. Every day. <laughs> so basically I'm here in Berlin uh, for weekend because thanks to my students, uh, who I'm supervising, Anna. Anna, if you're watching, hi. <laughs> um, she should be in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she really uh, generously uh, suggests that I, mm. she will take care of myself while I'm, I'm away. So I think this um, physical presence there mm. all the time is, I guess, the, the worst thing, but unfortunately that's that's the business. So mm. uh, I have friends who work with yeast, for example. She studied oh, yeah. double DNA damage in yeast. And she said, yeah, when I got annoyed with them, I just put them in a the fridge, in a real fridge, not in the fridge, uh -huh. in the fridge. So they stop dividing and I just go home. Ooh, if I'm annoyed at my yeast, <laughs> put them in the fridge. So, and another friend of mine, she works with cancer cells. And I mean, your whole point to kill those cells, right? Right. So, and once I had a conversation with her and she had a very stressful period. Uh, she was writing some grant and I was like, and I said, oh yeah, sorry, I have to go because I have to feed my cells uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the weekend. And she was like, cells, what? I have cells actually this week. And she forgot about them for like five days, but it's cancer cells, so, so they're yeah. still alive and well. Um, and it's, Damn it. it's stem cells, it's unfortunately, unfortunately not it's the different. case. So I guess the worst thing is like this really physical thing, presence yeah. there. Um, the best thing, I mean, I can grow mini brain. It's Okay, you just I can really drag, cool. I can brag about this all the long. So yeah, I yeah. guess that's the coolest thing that really like you physically created something which yeah. looks kind of mm. like a part of your own brain. I mean, okay, that's cool. Yeah. Like, okay, you win. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more that's um um that that we discussed earlier, but obviously not not on camera yet. Um. I wrote down that you work with embryo cells mm -hmm. amongst other ones. And how did you feel testing on that in the beginning? Because, I mean, we talked about how you feel about working with cells, but just the word embryo already people are like, oh my God, ah, you know, like mm -hmm. it's controversial. And then also where you get most or well, all of the donor cells from, because mm -hmm. you said donor cells, right? Yeah. To, to get them, where do you get that? Like, where do they come from? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so my PhD project was completely based on reprogrammed cells. Mm -hmm. So I didn't work with embryo cells right. in a okay. classical understanding of it. So mm -hmm. 
I had some cells reprogrammed from a, a fetus patient, so it was never born because of the severity of the disorder. Mm -hmm. So one cell line derived from that. Uh, but I never worked with like established embryonic right. uh, healthy stem cell line. Um, since I was done with my PhD project and now I'm working on another disorder, I do use um, I do use uh, well established um, line uh, as part of my project. And uh, so by the law, uh, you can first of all, of course, it takes very a lot of. Uh, um, like uh, German bureaucracy at its finest. Um, uh, yeah, you're takes... welcome. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think it's absolutely correct that these things have to be monitored strictly. Right, and yeah. uh, uh, but I guess some people exaggerate a little bit with that, and they think that we like I don't know hunting down pregnant babies. Women, you pregnant know, we don't yes. do that. So because right. people imagine that we're evil. Uh, creatures who mm. just want to have a hold on on the real human cells. This is not, of mm. course, the case. And um, so, once you uh, there is a, a specific institute which is responsible for evaluation all of your requests to work with the. So you have to write. It's in a way a little bit like a business plan. Right. So you have to write everything you want to do with the cells mm -hmm. and why mm -hmm. so you have to define every single experiment because with the reprogram cells you don't have to do that but with embryonic stem cells you have to define every single experiment and explain why you can't use any other cells that makes so sense. the reason has to be really valid and then some people who uh, who scientists themselves who work for this institution they revise your um, your request uh, and if they think yeah it's reasonable uh, they grant you this request and once you have it um, I mean it takes very long time yes yeah? so it's very official procedure and involves mm. a lot of writing and, and, and evaluation and so on and once you've been granted this um, you actually buy themselves so you buy, you buy you order <laughs> them online yes the, the lab or like the university or the, does it kind of it has to be the person so that got it, the grant right um it depends right. so most of the time it's granted under specific project so whoever mm -hmm. works with this project are allowed to because of course we keep all the uh, all the documentation of everything we do in the lab mm -hmm. uh, so of course they would know who work with this if they have questions right. you know uh, but um, normally it's granted not to a specific person but to a specific project right. because of course people can change right you mm -hmm. can employ someone new to this project and so on uh, so normally it's granted for a project and uh, once you've been granted this uh, or your lab your institute um, you can buy them and there are like a list of certified cell banks from which you can order cells right so you basically go online it's like an online it's like amazon online. for cells. A, li a little bit yeah and you choose like type disease healthy non-healthy gender uh, and That's all so cool. kinds of things um, you you have all kinds of documentation about the cells you know everything about them um, sometimes I think I have I, I know more about myself than about my yeah. myself <laughs> inside me. Um, and of course, then uh, it's been uh, evaluated all the time. And once your project is done, you have to write a report to this institute. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of results you know were obtained and, and right. so on. Yeah. So and whenever you want to include a new experiment inside this frame, you have to write an additional request. Uh, to incorporate in one new experiment. So mm -hmm. it's extremely strict because normally, of course, you do experiments, you get the results, and then you reevaluate what you wanted to do in the first place, right? Because mm -hmm. if you get some results opposite from what you would expect, right? They're not necessarily one, they're just different. So you have to readjust your plan. Mm -hmm. And with this cells, you cannot just do it yourself. So right. whenever yeah. you got something you would like to do on top, of what you wrote, uh, you have to again kind of apply. But then the procedure, of course, faster because once you already been granted the, the, mm -hmm, the full mm -hmm. request, then they would just evaluate and say, yeah, okay, this makes total sense. You are allowed. And where does the cell bank get this 
cells is it people that can donate to that so, so yes yeah, like, so wanna... the bank for example from which we were buying cells it's in the u.s mm -hmm. and uh, of course they have like uh, from all the uh, governmental agencies including the fda they have all the N NIH, so National Institute of Health, mm -hmm. um, they of course have uh, very strict regulations about, uh, of course it has to be a written a concept, right? right? If it's fetus, then from parents, mm -hmm. uh, from both of them, if it's, uh, of course, if it's just a grown up person, you write yourself that I'm agree with donating myself and so on. And also you can always check it uh, when you buy the cell, so they always stay this. So right. uh, it's not like they can just take any kind of random cells mm. and, and and sell it. You know, this of course this never happens. So okay. uh, yeah. And um, because you talked about how the um, you have to be at the lab basically every day, right? Mm -hmm. And so the current how's the current? I mean, now it's probably getting uh, the restrictions are getting looser and stuff. But a few months ago, when everywhere was shut down like i work at the university too we still like basically shut down to foot traffic <laughs> and uh you have to like you have to write ourselves in a list of when we're at the university just to make sure not too many people in the same building stuff like that so um how has the current situation changed how you work in the lab because if several people have these cells or there are several people in the lab how have you dealt with that. <laughs> you know. So um, actually, I mean, we're still working. So mm -hmm. our institute was not completely shut down. Right. We were working, but as you said, like we also had, I don't know, like five, six pages of new regulations who allow mm -hmm. to speak to whom, uh, and so on. And we anyway divided into groups. But during this time, we were divided into even more subgroups. So. Uh, if you already, I mean, luckily we have quite a lot of space in our office spaces, so it was not that big problem. You were masked, right? To, uh, to, anyway, <laughs> I mean, we wore masks all the time, so yeah, this yeah. is a re requirement, right? Mm -hmm. In in the university, in any university building, and our institute is on cl Uniclinicum campus, right? So there, it's um, even more strict, right? So. Um, yeah, so we were of course wearing masks all the time, uh, keep the distance and so on. And uh, uh, people who um, who are in the bigger groups and they have to share the cell culture facility, for example. So they had shifts. Uh, right. They knew who come and when, so they can adjust how, how many people are mm. at the same room at the same specific given time. And um, in case you you have to physically people from two different subgroups have to do an experiment together mm. like something that cannot be avoided in any way uh, then we have to and we're still doing that um we have to fill out we have like an online form where you have to fill out with whom you were exactly doing something and uh, for how long and uh, so all the kind of the details so in case something happens then um, they could um, yeah course. quarantine and right. so on yeah but I mean luckily uh, in our case there was not even one single confirmed uh, right. case of so in our institute right mm -hmm. so it was not shut down and okay. um, but yeah it was really really difficult because mm -hmm. everyone needs to be there and it was quite hard to organize how to do it that it's still reasonable yeah um yeah but we were not shut down so okay. we were working on it does anybody else have any questions i mean i still have two <laughs> <laughs> but uh if there's someone else i don't want to take all the time up by just asking my own questions so if you have any um let bonnie know if you want to speak up and if not you can um of course write them in the chat like um Catherine and maria did and um we'll read them out so um maybe until we see if there are more um i wanted to ask if there's a milestone or s something you wanted to achieve in your research and um you're done with your phd now so you still have to defend yeah but maybe maybe if you you're already done with it so um is there like a big milestone you reached something you wanted to do 
and you actually done it like is there so i mean i really wanted to do i still don't have a title yet right so i right. don't have a defense yet so um so this would be of course the huge milestone i want to achieve and just you know knows that i i've i've done it yeah. because it's uh yeah it's a lot of work and then you really need to see you need to see the outcome yeah, yeah. um yeah so i guess at the moment it's the like top priority on my list to finally be done with that so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've heard that from many people that yeah. are phd i just yeah. want to be done and i want to have the title and then just move on because yeah. it's always there's always something next right yes exactly. so um yeah i guess um because you already i guess you already passed your time as a phd even though you don't have like the paper in yeah. your hand yet but what are you working on now because you uh briefly said that you do something different now but you're still at the same institute yeah you so, have your students now right yeah so. yeah yeah so actually i so now i do a bit more teaching than usual mm -hmm. uh, i supervise my students plus our institute is a part of the university mm -hmm. so we um we sign in for a lot of teaching but this is pretty pretty cool actually so i quite enjoy that and uh, um i still work with uh, rare disorder <laughs> <laughs> different type of rare disorder i work with the um, which calls tuberous sclerosis so basically what happens it's also a gene mutation and uh, it's very complicated um disorder because what happens because normally every cell in our body has the same dna mm -hmm. and uh, but in some specific cases they can be so-called mosaic so like mm -hmm. mosaic and um, in this case it's really what happens so when very early in uh, during embryogenesis so when the embryo is like maybe a month old mm -hmm. i don't know uh, no one knows this for sure it's just a hypothesis that very early whatever this very early means in this case uh what happens is that all the cells in the body of this embryo uh loses half uh, of the of this gene of this one specific gene mm -hmm. and later on in the development most probably in second trimester um some of the cells very few randomly loses the second half of this gene so some cells end up to be completely uh, in complete absence of this gene. I see. And what happens, um, because one of the, so the disorder is caused by, <clears throat> by the mutation in one of the two genes. So it's never both of them, it's one, one of two. And uh, those are tumor suppressor genes. Mm. So what happens uh, uh, when one of them is missing, uh, because normally, the, I mean, to, to very long story, very short, what happens you have normally you have uh, the gene and out of the gene if it's a code in region of our dna there is a protein that being made according to this instruction written in our dna code and um, in this case there are two proteins with being uh, produced and normally they have a they form a complex and this complex only together these two genes uh, these two proteins can inhibit, so basically kind of slow down the activity of another very important metabolic pathway mm -hmm. in the cell. And basically what happens is that one of this protein gene, and therefore protein, is missing. This complex is not strong enough because it's then not really a complex, it's just a half of it. Right. So it cannot basically um, inhibit strong enough. Mm -hmm. And then cells start to uh, be much more metabolically active. So a lot of processes in the cell became like much more active than usually would be. So mm -hmm. cells became uh, morphologically, so how they look, they're much bigger. Um, if, it's, if those cells which lost the gene in the brain, they form so kind of like, it's, even, it's an official term, balloon cells. So they really look oh, like a okay. balloon. Uh, or giant cells because oh. they're just huge. Um, the same could happen in kidney and liver, for mm. example. It happens quite often with these patients, and most of the time they suffer from uh, insufficiency, liver insufficiency, or kidney insufficiency. Right. Um, because uh, this formation, this tubus formation, they um, 
uh, cancer-like mm -hmm. because they do not grow too much. So patients never die from cancer, like terminal ill cancer patients. But what happens is that um, it disrupts the function of the organ. Mm -hmm. um, so kidney cannot function properly, liver cannot function properly. Plus, um, uh, all the patients, like 90% of the patients, have it also in the brain. Oh. And when they have it in the brain, it disrupts completely the six-layer cortex, mm -hmm. this layered uh, gray matter of our brain. And what happens then? Um, ep epileptic seizures. Right, right, right. And uh, some, some of the, and a majority of the patients, so if I'm not mistaken, it's like 87% or something, have pharmacoresistant epilepsy, which means that normal drugs, again, epilepsy won't help. Oh. So somehow this epilepsy is so strong uh, that it most of the time can be stopped only by removing this, uh, this thing from the right. brain. Okay. Uh, but this comes the most difficult part. If the, this tumor-like structure in a part of the brain that just cannot be removed, because it really depends where in the brain of course, it is. Yeah. So because by removing it, you can do even more harm yeah. than actual, uh, actual improvement mm -hmm. of a patient's life. Um, and uh, you just have to imagine some patients have extremely strong epilepsy in this case. They have like seizures 20 times a day. Oh, like yeah. it's extremely painful. It's yeah. not just disturbing life in general. It's also extremely painful. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so yeah, and then you have to chronically uh, take a lot of drugs to somehow minimize the effect on that. And that's how you end up with the liver insufficiency right, and right, kidney right. insufficiency because they have to metabolically reactivate these drugs, right? Deactivate these drugs. So, um, and still don't know, no one really knows um, what, what is the reason behind this appearance of these huge cells. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, they're metabolically active, but... Uh, what is the exact reason? Yeah. Because if we would know the exact reason, maybe we could tackle it with a drug, yeah. you know, and then help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, this is not, and uh, probably the going for organoids, it's quite, um, quite useful now too, because the point is that in mice, even if you uh, make them generate this weird giant balloon cells, some of them I still don't have epilepsy. So they look like it. Right, okay, so that's always happen. Exactly. And in patients, it's always the case. They always have Just not mice. So, so there is something human specific yeah. to this that mice simply do not yeah. develop. Right. And uh, if we find out what, maybe then we also can uh, tackle this with mm. the, the drug, you know, with the modifier or something, mm. because it's a chronic disease. It, you will live with that, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's it's not something which you have for a period of time and mm, yeah. and then it gets better. No, if you don't do anything, it does not get better. Yeah. So um, Man, you like to work with these rare diseases. <laughs> <laughs> They're all sound horrible. Yeah, it's a bit like a you know like a investigation in a way because yeah. like you have a suspect and then you have an <laughs> outcome <laughs> so you have a crime basically <laughs> so you need to to find the, the you know the, the one who's yeah, guilty you. The, you. the guilty one and we still don't know uh, who's the guilty one mm. in this case because uh, even with all the fancy uh, techniques we have in biology now uh, which also includes the so called single cell RNA seq sounds very difficult but basically what it does is that you can um, find out in every cell you want to check what kind of proteins uh, exactly could be expressed in this cell and uh, uh, of course then it has a specific signature so by doing that you can say okay this is a neuron this is like a muscle cell this is uh, by by analyzing what those cells are expressing, mm -hmm. and the problem with these giant cells that it's still not clear whether they near they used to be neurons or they used to be glia cells. Right. So these cells which are surrounding neurons. Mm -hmm. So even this is not clear yet. We don't even know what type of cells God. they are. <laughs> so it's so complicated, and uh, um, 
yeah so sometimes it's extremely frustrated because you work and work and work and work and nothing comes out of it mm -hmm. right so um uh, but uh, i mean if it would be easy it won't be science mm. so. yeah <laughs> we have one more question on the topic maybe you can um help with that uh Vishnu wants to know um throw some light on non-epileptic seizures because the, i have again i'm not a neurobiologist so i've heard that there are differences yeah but you probably know better right <laughs> so i personally don't work for example with patients at all right, right. so i'm not seeing mm -hmm. patients and i'm also not not a doctor so right, right, right. i can um i can uh, tell you just what about the um epileptic mm. ones right because they caused by the problems in the brain non-epileptic one uh, i mean some people think that they've been caused by uh not seeing so not the central nervous system but more um uh, peripheral nervous system so basically when you have a seizure like muscle seizure very strong uh that it might derive from a problems with the with those motor neurons I was talking before oh. about, which connects to everything and then on the very top is the brain. So, uh, but as I said, I'm not really an expert in that. Mm. So I can just say that um, uh, to my best knowledge, um, they originate from uh, not, uh, not the brain dysfunction per se, but uh, more local problems. Right, right. Yeah, I, um, I actually saw um, a video from someone who talked about she wanted to take her shirt off and her earring got caught in the shirt and the earring kind of like lodged into her like ear like really randomly and it was severe pain and she had just like a seizure from it and then she had to go and get these brain scans and stuff and they said like no 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 this was just from the local insane amount yeah. of pain you felt yeah. She like literally like blacked out, so, fell down. So it had, might be like, you know, a local chronic inflammation because right. of this enormous pain. And then because the chronic pain is also another very interesting subject, but it's also peripheral, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's local and specific. and then the question is whether does brain does something for you to feel this local pain or is it really local? Whether it's right, really right. like a mm -hmm. simply an inflammation of a specific uh, external outgrowth, so basically the, the the outgrowth of the neuronal cell, which innervates the mm. specific um, specific muscle, right, to contract. So this is also very ex extremely interesting topic. But still, the the chronic pain is still very un unknown, undiscovered, mm. uh, uh, undiscovered thing. That's why it's so hard to treat those right. patients yeah. because you simply don't know the the reason behind this you know mm. you don't know okay why is in this muscle you feel so much pain mm. and so much tension um and one of the reasons which people suggest it might be a chronic inflammation so right yeah so does anybody have any other questions otherwise i think we are almost at the end i think um we thought we would go up until what four right yeah it's just 10 minutes ago <laughs> but um i think we talked about lots of interesting things today like i mean i i've known you for well the first time we met was like seven months ago yeah but we, we talked before and um, yeah. i still so we so work. we're basically uh, a living proof that twitter friends are yeah friends. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the record yeah <laughs> we um yesterday we met with our, our friend anna who was um on coffee clutch in september and then again uh, two months ago for the first digital one and it's the first time you guys met yeah so, so um, i was invited for her birthday yeah. and then her friends were like oh how did you met and we're like we met like 10 minutes ago, you were 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, uh, but of course i mean we knew each other yeah, yeah. online but yeah. what i mean and we had very interesting discussions and uh, also i attended anna's cafe clutch and mm -hmm. i also had a lot of questions you did yeah you were there <laughs> and then stuff like this so but um yeah like really in in person i got to know her just yesterday oh my god yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> it's quite rewarding because friendships came out of absolutely this. yeah, yeah. And, so, and everyone does something different and for example like yesterday was one of her friend and colleague at the same picnic and they and she had 
questions to me about how I freeze in this structure because she works with another type of tissue and she had some problems with that. So basically, oh, yeah, I, you talked about that. I, yeah. I explained her exactly what I'm doing and, and how I'm doing that. So there you go, like science yeah. communication, yeah. and it's fine. And my so, speaker uh, next next time in, oh, right, all, she in August, well. her name yeah. is Lisa, and she was also at that picnic. And yeah. I had a message with her about her research a little bit. And um, I recognized her, and I was like, "Don't I like know you from from somewhere?" It's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna be uh, at your event next month." I'm like, "Oh yeah," <laughs> because now we don't really have that many, and it was like an outdoor gathering. Yeah. Um, like I don't right now meet up with a lot of scientists, so we do do um, everything on Skype, and um, we do yeah, like the pre pre talks about the. Um, uh, about their research and so like like a little get together beforehand and uh, we did that too right like yeah, we had, yeah, we had a Skype, yeah. Yeah. Skype meeting um, yeah I mean now everything happens online on, online yeah. yeah so I mean at our institute also even when we are kind of almost all there physically but in the very separate rooms yeah, yeah. we still meet online even yeah. though we're all at the at the same building but mm -hmm. we're still so I haven't had like in-person meeting for ages same. Like. and it's nice that lots of people we had some of them actually from Bonn I think uh, asked the question so it's nice that people from outside of Berlin can attend but I think uh, eventually uh, hopefully maybe we'll go back to the museum but I think for now yeah I mean I'm a huge dinosaur fan oh yeah I want to show you all something <laughs> That's a present I got from Francie. It's a socks with dinosaurs. The first so, time we met, we talked a lot about Tristan. Um, which is T-Rex. Yeah, the, the T-Rex uh, yeah. that was at the National History Museum. It's now in Copenhagen Yeah, for another like a year and a half or something like that. Yeah, so I'm a oh, huge, yeah. uh, huge dinosaur fan. And uh, I was so excited when I thought, oh, I will be standing in that museum <laughs> talking next about time. mini brains. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe next time. Maybe yeah. we can do it again another time. Yeah, I mean, by that, maybe, by then, maybe I will figure out what are those sounds, weird giant sounds in, in the brain. It <laughs> will be very quickly, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, if there are not um, more questions, maybe... Yeah, we have another question. Okay. There is another question. No? Yeah, there is one. I only see... Oh, are there, no, the ethical ones. And then there are the survey. Is there another yeah. one? I don't. Oh, question. Yeah, 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 the survey. Then you have to scroll down. It's a question oh, from yeah. me. I know you touched on it briefly, but is it possible for someone just off the street to donate cells, or is it more of an opt-in pulling some kind of post? Oh, of medical pre. Oh, okay. So in case you were at the hospital already, they're like, oh, why is you here? <laughs> can we got have some, or if someone no. can just come uh, in and volunteer? Uh, yeah. So uh, short answer, no. So in in Germany, it's extremely strictly regulated and uh, I think there is some um, uh, some exceptions for example if it's uh, uh, you are considered to be healthy uh, so it's always hard to say completely healthy control cells because I'm pretty sure even if yeah. I sequence my own cells I would be like oh god what's right happening now? there yeah <laughs> so um, so I guess with the with the healthy cells uh, again you have to be a part of of all kind of grants application officially approved where you will work with human cells. And so it's not just like this, for example, I'm curious, um, there are certain genes which are responsible for, for example, early onset of ice gun mm -hmm. disease. And I would be like, can I, can I donate yeah. my own blood? I want to know this. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I don't, but if I would like to know this, um, it's not possible just like that. So there has to be an official, uh, official regulation, official plan. Uh, for example, sometimes like one of my colleagues, she she works with um, cells derived from very different age of uh, of the donors, of healthy donors. Um, so of course there is a specific project and vote, and then they look for donors who are willing to. I mean, just like. It's amount of blood you would normally give for normal blood tests, so it's not not a lot. It's not like donation of a blood, so it's really small amount. And um, but of course it has to be strictly regulated. But Plus, a normal person could do it. That's I think the question was if I'm as a normal person, let's say I work in the most of the time. No, 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 no. So that's not happening like that. So only when you are. Uh, 
specifically, for example, looking for, let's assume, very old donor, which is still considered to be a healthy person. And I know that she had cells, I guess, from someone who's like uh, 97 years old or oh, something. Wow. And um, so then you kind of, you specifically look for these people, yeah? So for when they uh, involved in any kind of studies or, so it's not like, oh, oh I'm so curious, I'm gonna do that. No, you not. Oh, so she maybe previously already have been involved. In Somehow, her. yeah. Okay. Plus, I, I mean, I think the exception would be only if you have a really extremely rare disease that someone is working on now directly. Okay maybe you will be approached and asked would you be willing to but of course you have to have all kind of right consents and right, right, right. forms and you have to understand what is happening mm. what exactly would be done to yourselves and so on yeah right but most of the time it's at least in germany so uh, because rules are quite different in different european countries so I know, for example, in the UK, mm -hmm. um, it's a bit more, um, yeah, more loose, I would say. I think if I know who this person is, I might, I might not, but I think then she is in the UK. Yeah, so in the UK, it's, it's a bit more easy, okay. easy going. <laughs> <laughs> so you can really, if you want, you can really donate yourselves. Um, okay, that's, so it's very different I, in Germany. I, I, yeah, so Germany has, I guess, the most strict rules in the EU on right. uh, working with human material of mm -hmm. any kind. Um, and of course, I mean, if those cells would be used for reprogramming, so then of course, person have to understand what exactly will be That's done. Mean, yeah. So her, her or his DNA would be taken and uh, would be telling to forget and then to make them do something, something else. else. Right, or right, you right. can, or you will copy paste something mm -hmm. inside or you will cut something from right. it. You know, so then uh, of course, person has have to be fully aware of what will happen to, to the cells. Right. Yeah. Okay. But uh, just from the like, from the street. <laughs> so if you were passing by Charité and think, oh, uh, nice day to make some sales. I don't I think I, before. <laughs> I, just I, I, I don't think they would be like, um, okay. Yeah, okay, no, no, this, okay. Uh, this would probably not. So not basically it depends on the country's regulations. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's extremely, so another example since we're on the, okay. Almost time. Maybe yeah, I one. just very short about the UK, for example, there was a couple of, years ago i think like three years ago um they were allowed to um use the um, um embryos which were a couple of days old mm -hmm. embryos which were frozen after the in vitro fertilization mm -hmm. procedure uh to do the genome editing on these human embryos right. and they were so one of the uh, very important gene um which associated with, uh, with miscarriages due to not being able to um, kind of connect to, to the, to to the, the womb. tissue. Right. Yes. Um, they cut out this gene from completely healthy, otherwise um, uh, embryos, and they kept it in culture, I think, for another like 10 or 12 days, if I'm not more than two weeks for sure, but I don't remember mm. the exact amount of days, after which they have to destroy it, of course. Right. It's, it, I mean, it's human embryo. Um, and for so how to do that? Of course, mm -hmm. they release all the consents that the, uh, the couples uh, from whom this embryo was, they were fully aware of the what mm -hmm. going to happen and, and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, they were allowed to do that. Right. So I don't think this would be allowed mm. in Germany, at least at the current situ current state of the law, uh, because also we discussed it briefly before that the work which is so work which would violate the rules, it would cons which has something to do with the embryonic stem cells in Germany would consider a criminal law. So it's not administrative law, it's a criminal law. So you can be really... Um, or you can go to jail, right? Basically, yeah. yes. So, and I mean, it's regulated so strict that so there is no way, possible. honestly speaking, I really, yeah. I cannot imagine a way you can possibly do this because right. uh, it's also very offensive to culture, oh. human cells in general. So institutes who have a facilities for that, they for sure stick to all kind of rules of and course. regulations because we're being checked all the time. It's mm. not like so. Um, 
do what you want. Exactly. <laughs> We're being checked all the time. So the, the regulatory a commission could come to the institute and open your incubator or warm fridge as we now know it <laughs> and ask okay you have here 10 plates show me your lab book from today mm. what have you done with the cells where they coming from and all the documentation and you have to be able to deliver this right. because otherwise i mean it's a crime yeah. so um yeah so really? don't so don't think that it's uh just do whatever <laughs> exactly it's not true so we're being really strictly regulated as i guess it should be when you want yeah to yeah yeah definitely so yeah i hope you all learned a lot <laughs> today and yeah you're welcome Mira. thank you for for joining and for everybody that joined on zoom um Next time, I think we're going to be on YouTube again and on Zoom and the chat. If you maybe missed the beginning, it's going to be put on YouTube later on. Um, so you'll be able to watch it then. And yeah, the next Coffee Clutch is on the first Sunday uh, in August. I don't right now know if that's the first or the second. <laughs> um, the second. The second. So it's going to be on the second. Um, and if you want to get updates on that, you can always check the museum website and also us on social media. It's Kaffee Clash with Wissenschaft. Um, on Twitter, I post updates, also a link to the museum. So if you want to stay up to date, you can find us there. And yeah, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming all the way from, from Bonn. <laughs> yeah, everyone yeah. was like, you came from and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I didn't come from moon, I came from yeah. home, but yeah. yeah. But you know, you had to, to wear a mask on the train. That's true. Deutsche Bahn make it very pleasant during this. <laughs> as usual, yeah. But, yeah. Um, but thank you so much yeah. for coming. Yeah, um, I, I'm really uh, glad to be here as well and uh, have kind of a feeling of normality, I think. Yeah. Because we sit together. <laughs> yeah, we can. Yeah, Talk nice. without mask yeah, and yeah. Um, yeah, I hope maybe at some point we'll it hasn't been a hug yet, yet, but yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> we make just an elbow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah I hope everybody is staying yeah. um, healthy and happy, and um, we hope to see you next time. And thank you so much for coming. And again, if you haven't filled in the survey yet, it would help us out if you let us know if you liked it or if you have any suggestions for next time. Let us know then we can keep improving. Um, so even though it has almost been a year, there's still obviously space to improve there is upwards. Always, there always, is always, yeah. Space, yeah. So yeah. thank you very much and we hope to see you next time. Have a nice time.